Welcome to Mediria. This is Umar Tariq. Today we have another Mediria mentee, Dr. Salar Sarwar Khan. Uh, we're going to do his mock interview. Salar, how are you doing? I'm good, Dr. Tariq. Thanks for asking. How are you? Good, good. So can you briefly tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Well, yes, I'm an international medical graduate from Pakistan. I graduated from Federal Medical College. Uh, I just got back from the U.S. I did four clinical rotations, the most recent one being in uh, San Bernardino. It's a University of California Riverside program, and I rotated with hospitalists for about four weeks. And it was probably the most uh, learning experience I had in the U.S., uh, primarily because I got to see how the internal medicine department works and uh, how hospitalists go about their everyday life. And I got to see patients and it was a, it was a great experience. Prior to that, I rotated in, uh, with Dr. Ali, he's a cardiologist. Uh, I, I did that in St. Agnes Hospital. Uh, I got to see cardiac catheterizations. I got to see outpatients. Uh, it was also another great experience. I did two more at, uh, at clinics. They were private clinics for, with two neurologists. Uh, in the future, I right now my focus is trying to get into internal medicine residency. And I also have this uh, a dream of creating a free education platform, especially for the underprivileged. And I want to do this online so it can be accessed globally. Okay, pretty, pretty cool. So tell me about a little bit about this uh, global initiative. Um, I would like to hear more about it. Well, what I want to do is, uh, I don't know if you've heard of, of Pathoma. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a, a board exam resource for uh, USMLE uh, step one exam for pathology. So I want to take what he's done in pathology and I want to apply to medicine. And I believe that residency training in the US is going to uh, elevate me to that level where I can actually uh, be that person who records those lectures and uh, create that uh, education platform. And the thing about Pathoma is, uh, I was listening to one of those uh, YouTube videos of Dr. Sattar. He was talking about how he had some teachers that made you feel like they were talking through you, like they were so powerful. And even in those videos, if you if you listen to them, it does not feel like you're listening in a video lecture. It just feels like he's right there with you. So the power, the, it's such a powerful teaching tool. Uh, and, and I want to, I want to try to emulate that. Okay. Um, and I see from your personal statement, you're a passionate soccer player. Yes. So uh, tell me a little bit, like, uh, how do you, uh, what, what position you play in and what do you enjoy the most in soccer? Well, I will start from the beginning. I was I used to play cricket all the time as a kid, but we, I went to live in England for one year and I got basically infected with soccer. I, I play as a striker. I've been playing this position. I, sometimes I play as a center midfielder. Sometimes I play as a striker, but it's been my most, uh, it's something I do almost every day. I've been doing since school life. Uh, apart from that, I also play a bit of cricket, but I also follow Pakistan cricket team a lot, and I rarely ever miss a match. So I would say, and also I love to watch tennis. Uh, so yeah, all of my uh, free time goes into watching or playing sports. Okay. So somebody who plays sports, you know, soccer and cricket, uh, what, what is a common thing that you see between these competitive sports and medicine? Well, the thing, uh, the drive, uh, I take, I have taken inspiration from some of the best football players, some of the best cricket players. It's just about the discipline and the drive. The, 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 the sports person, the, the, the sportsmen who make it to the very top, they're, every one of them, they have this discipline in their everyday life and they have the drive to improve every day. So I feel like I, all of us and myself, I can learn a lot from that. And when I apply it to my everyday life, I, I actually did do that when I was uh, trying to uh, take the USMLE exams and, and go down this road. I feel like it's, it's something that helped me improve uh, a lot. And it's something that keeps me going. But I, I look to these people when I, I need a source for inspiration. Okay. 
What's been your uh, biggest challenge that you have overcome? The biggest challenge as in uh, medically? Sure. It could be anything personal, medical, professional. Well, when I was preparing for my USMLE Stat 1 exam, uh, my cousin, he got diagnosed with cancer. He had a, it was a very rare tumor, a non seminomatous germ cell tumor, and it was in his anterior mediastinum. So it was, it was difficult to, because he had inpatient chemotherapy and I had to be with them a few days a week, a few nights a week, actually. So it was difficult to juggle that time, uh, especially while preparing for my USMLE Step 1 exam. But it, it was something that it made the whole family closer. It made me closer to him. And it helped me actually improve as a clinician and as an individual. So it is, it is something that I learned a lot from. It was difficult. But I have no regrets. Okay, I'm sorry to hear about it. Um, so, what do you think was is your biggest strength as a doctor, as an applicant? Well, as even before medical school, I am someone who learns a lot from his surroundings, and I'm someone who is uh, who is very teachable. When I got into medical school, I actually found it difficult to adapt to books because all my te- all my learning beforehand was used for my professors and my teachers. So the idea of learning independently and self-learning was kind of new to me. I managed to do it and I, and I, you know, I do, I do it pretty well now, but initially I struggled a lot with it. So in a clinical setting, I am, I will be someone who is very easy to teach and who is very eager to learn and who will absorb everything. And I learned, I remember so much more from every clinical interaction I had with my attendings or my residents. What's your biggest weakness? My biggest weakness. Well, my biggest, (laughs) I would say it is the inability to give uh, negative feedback. I feel like sometimes it is very important uh, and it's sometimes very imperative, but I have uh, struggled with that in the past. Uh, So I would say that is one of my biggest weaknesses. Uh, I have not been able to avoid burnout in the past. So finding a work-life balance is sometimes difficult for me. Uh, but I have gotten better at that as well. It is, it's, it's a steep learning curve and, I, and I'm, you know, I'm getting better. Is there something that annoys you, irritates you? Something <laughs> that trivial? Well, it's, something that's when someone nags me uh, something it's yes it is trivial but you know when someone's just very repetitive with something and keeps on you know repeating it yeah that can sometimes irritate me but not something major okay what is one thing that you would uh, you wish you could change about yourself there's a lot uh but i would say in general i would like to improve on every aspect uh one of those things is I feel like I need to work more on my personal relationships with my family and friends. I feel like I need to spend more time uh, and more effort. Uh, and of course, I want to improve as uh, as a doctor as well. So yes, I would. I want to constantly improve on every single aspect of myself, and that's what I would you know like to change in a positive direction. Okay, so you you said you don't, you're not able to spend enough time um, with your friends and family. Why is that? I feel like sometimes I get too too immersed in my work and too immersed in whatever the task is at hand, and I sort of lose track of time. Uh, but that's again have to do with the work life balance I talked about earlier. That is something mm-hmm. I am improving on. Something I'm learning from every day. So. Uh, okay. It is. It's a work in progress. Um, is it um, more because of work, or is it because of your hobbies? Is it in uh, your sports that are keeping you away from your family? No, it's not the sports. It's it's primarily. It's not the hobbies. It's just that it's the work mostly. Uh, yeah. What I have to do, I, I just get so obsessed with it is that I sometimes you know lose track of people around me. Yeah. So what are you doing currently that currently is keeping working- you away from your family? <laughs> currently i'm working as a as a telemedicine doctor uh it's uh it's 
it's a remote free clinic. It's in a free clinic, which is in a remote village in Kashmir. Uh, it's a village to which my mother's side of the family belongs to. And my uncle, he runs this clinic and uh, we provide, you know, he collects donations and I help him with it. And he, we provide uh, medicines to the people in need. And I'm working as a telemedicine doctor. So he calls me when he gets a patient and, you know, it's, it's a very remote area. Okay. So our hospital is very busy. You know, we expect you to see multiple patients, put in notes, multitask, place orders, do a lot of things at the same time. Do you think yeah. uh, efficiency, multitasking, getting things done in a t in time, is that something you struggle with? No, that, that is, I, I don't believe so. Uh, I feel like when I have a lot of things to do, I can easily make my own schedule. I'm very good at planning and I'm very good at time management. So when I have multiple tasks at hand, I, I will make a plan. And I, more than often than not, now I know my limits. The last couple okay. of two, three years, I know what my limits are and I know what I can achieve in a set amount of time. So I know what I can do in this time. And, you know, I, I, can, I can manage that pretty well now. Okay, give me an example of uh, something that shows that, that, you know, you plan pretty well and you got things done in time and you executed an entire project. Uh, start to finish uh, some things to get things done in time? Well, just right now, like I'm applying for residency application two years out of medical school. I graduated in 2020. And ever since that, this is a project I've been working on. The USM is step one, step two, step three. I've taken all these steps in the, uh, I was actually done with all three steps in May of this year. So it took me about two years to take the steps and alongside i was also i was i did an externship i did an intern uh at a, i did the externship at a clinic in Rawalpindi. then i did a internship at a research center in islamabad uh, it was on a brain computer inf interface project and i was studying for my exams alongside that and d during the internship my duties included reading researches online and trying to see how we can implement and how we, what we can learn from those brain computer interfaces and how we can apply that in Pakistan. So that was quite a lot of work, but I was also studying with studying for my tests with it. And then I traveled to the US, I did the rotations and then took step three. So all of this, this was going on parallel simultaneously. So I was able to manage all that pretty well. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. So typically in America, you know, most of the American graduates, they take the USMLE exams during med school. They don't take dedicated time off. Uh, whereas I'm noticing more and more IMGs, uh, they're taking dedicated time off afterwards. Uh, why is that? You guys can't take uh, USMLE exams during medical school? Well, during medical school, we have our own set of exams and th they are not easy to navigate. So some people have but most of people they take it after graduating is because we have to have we have to focus on our own exams and our own tests and there those are happening every month and you know at the end of the year we have an end of the year exam and so we have five years five exam five final exams and then alongside we have exams every month so and it and our way of testing is a bit different from the the us the usmles it's not all mcqs we have vivas we have ospies oskies so it's a whole another different ball game that's yeah. why it, it's, it's it's a bit different interesting and uh, tell me something uh, why do you think you should be selected for residency training i feel like you will find out that i'm someone who is very eager to learn and I am someone who is very easy to get along with, actually. Uh, and during my last rotation, one of the attendings, they told me that uh, it was very nice having me on his team, even though I was with him for only 10 days, because primarily because he said I'm easy to work with. So I'm someone who will go the extra mile for his colleagues and his attendings. I am someone who cares a lot about how the work environment is. So I feel like I can, you know, I can be a valuable addition to your team. Okay. Give me an example of uh, something where you were able to get along well with others and help the entire team where your presence was able to make a difference, especially during your rotations. Well, 
I don't have, a, uh, okay. So during my rotations, I only spent about two to three days. And I feel like initially the residents in that team, because, you know, there was new residents, okay. They were PGY1s. So I felt like they were not getting along with each other very well and they weren't really talking. Uh, so I feel like I, since I wasn't the one with the duties and they were so busy, I feel like I was the one who was able to connect them and I was the one who was able to get, you know, a friendly environment and a, you know, and a nice, healthy uh, work environment going on, especially among the PGY ones who were new. Okay. So you were uh, instrumental in, in instrumental in getting people connected and making sure yeah. the team gets yes. well along together. Interesting. Yes. Uh, where do you see yourself in 10 years? That's a good question. Uh, right now, I'm my focus is primarily to get into internal medicine residency. That's my entire focus. I am, but if I think about further, I I could be working as a hot hospitalist. I I I like what hospitalists do. That is, I saw them closely, and I I really you know, I like what their how their life is about and how they can interact with. Uh, the patients and how they form relationships with the patients so that aspects of being a hospitalist you know they're really really attractive to me but that being said I, I cannot be sure like how life will go on after residency so my focus right now is internal medicine and of course my education project I hope to have made some significant grounds in that project in 10 years okay Last question. If uh, you're stranded by yourself on an island, what are three things, uh, three items you would like to take with you? I would take a Swiss knife, uh, the one with uh, the multiple, you know. Uh, I would take matches for fire. Okay. And I would also need something for shelter. So I would say... Uh, you know what those mosquito nets okay uh, and a sleeping bag yeah interesting it's the same thing uh, yeah. very nice very nice well uh good luck for the match season do you have any questions for me actually i do uh dr Eric. i was i read through a couple of uh, i was reading through your researches and i actually have a question about uh your especially the research about hepatocellular carcinoma uh i wanted to know how the fat containing metastases mm -hmm. in the adrenal gland uh, how do they mimic a primary uh, adrenal adenoma because i'm not very well versed in the radiology so if you could just briefly explain to me how you know how it, how they look alike and what what prompted you to uh, research and re write that research paper Okay, sure. So typically, uh, you know, fat containing uh, adrenal mats are almost are very rare. We don't typically see that, you know, um, and it's uh, typically like, you know, it's pointed out in the research paper, that's more uh, compatible with the uh, adenoma. And uh, that's what we were thinking. In this patient, you know, we saw uh, a mat from HCC, which has signal characteristics of adrenal adenoma, but we later found out that it wasn't present on prior studies. And uh, I, I don't recall if we did tissue sampling or not, but it was actually a MET from the HCC. So you can't say with 100% certainty, if you see an adrenal adenoma that contains fat, you can't just say slam dunk, it's an adenoma. It is, if the patient has a history of HCC, it is still possible that this could be a new MET, adrenal MET, which uh, wasn't present before. Okay, right. Thank you for that. Uh, mm -hmm. And I also have another question. Sure. Uh, I also was reading through uh, your research about uh, diagnosis of congenital heart diseases in kids and how mm -hmm. you use different MRIs. Uh, my question is, has 4-DPC replaced the 2-DPC in the practical setting now? Not really. That was That's something that I was hoping for as well 10 years ago. I will say some big institutions are using it because it's better visualizing visualization of a flow, a blood flow for flow quantification. It is pretty good, but mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, it takes decades, and there's still some things that we're trying to tweak. Uh, you know that research led to formation of a company, Artresis, and they're I think uh, they're the first FDA approved AI 
uh, company and uh, they're doing a lot of uh, research on this to propagate this further. Right now, I will say some big institutions have adopted it, but I wouldn't say it has completely replaced the two-dimensional traditional conventional imaging. So you wanted 4D uh, imaging because you felt like uh, you could now do venous flow measurement instead of arterial flow measurement. Is that correct? no? Let me let me explain. Yeah. So when you acquire uh, MR images, uh, the you're acquiring different slices. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, volumetric imaging is rather than acquiring slices of images, you're acquiring a volume. And then you once you acquire the volume, you reproduce from that volume multiple image slices. Now, because you have already acquired a volume, you can reproduce a sagittal, coronal, or axial slice. As compared to for MRI, we need to separately acquire a sagittal, separately acquire coronal, separately acquire axial. So that takes more time. So normal conventional MRI will take 40 to 50 minutes to acquire all these sequences, whereas the volumetric acquisition will take two to three minutes, and then the post-processing will take more time. But the patient is in the scanner for less time. Now, after all this, you can, uh, uh, in, for arterial flow quantification and venous flow quantification, in the past, you need to do multiple different sequences uh, with different banks. This is something velocity encoding. It's a uh, with different bank settings. But what we did um, showed in our research was that you can use the same bank settings, velocity encoding settings for arterial flow quantification. And you can use the same setting and you can measure venous flow, uh, venous flow with the, you know, reasonable accuracy, even with the, uh, even though the velocity encoding settings was more geared towards the arterial uh, flow quantification. So it's easier to do venous quantification compared to arterial? No, it's not, it's the same. It's not okay. easy or difficult, but the question was nobody really studied it. And people okay. thought that you need a lower bank settings and you need to a different sequence for venous flow quantification. Right, right, right. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. You're welcome. Do you have any other questions for me? No, I don't. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Khan. It was a pleasure having you. Good luck for the match. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Feedback time. All right, Salar. So, <laughs> Salar, how do you think you did? <laughs> Okay, I guess. Okay. <laughs> uh, what do you think was your, the best thing that you did in the entire interview? Look, I have no idea. I always know when I video and I have feedback. So I cannot okay. know during the okay, interview. Okay, that's fine. So uh, uh, initially, I'll say that uh, initially you were, uh, your eye contact with the camera wasn't that good. You know, but then you slowly walk towards it. I think you were just nervous or something, you know, because this session is being recorded. So it could make you a little nervous. Probably that could be it. Uh, in the other sessions that we have done that are not being recorded, I've seen you're always smiling and like you're very, very comfortable smiling. Just because I know you from other sessions, I think I, I noticed that smile was somewhere missing this the smile that you always have right when you're interviewing people when you're interviewing in other sessions with us when this is when you're not in a high pressure setting when it's not being recorded when uh it's not a real deal so you need to i would say probably do a little more practice get used to to being in a pressure setting okay um tell me about yourself was more towards when i asked you tell me about yourself uh you should be talking more about yourself. Yes, you can talk briefly that, okay, I recently worked in US and did these, these rotations, but I felt like that was a little too much uh, detail about your rotations. You can briefly talk about it, that, okay, I did these four months of rotations and I can tell you more about them if you okay. want, or if you have any questions, uh, or you can just say, uh, I did four, uh, four months of rotations in cardiology, gastroenterology and all that. And then if they ask you, then you can, uh, add upon that uh, overall content of the questions was good uh, mm -hmm. I felt a, see again it's a lot it's difficult for me because I know you so mm -hmm. I know how kind of like you're a pretty jolly person you have high energy level so I felt the confidence was a little low energy was a little low you did very good but these are the things probably I don't know it's like you just woke up in the morning these could be the little things doctor I was just I don't know uh maybe in an attempt to look more professional probably probably but you know like you're fine it was just a little thing that uh, i'll say if i wish you smiled a little bit more 
and came across a little more confident. But that's other than that, I think uh, you did you did pretty good. All right, everyone. I hope you uh, learned something from this interview. If you did, uh, please like it, share it with others, and subscribe to the channel. And like we always say, never give up, never lose hope. Mm -hmm.